Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to show you how to build a BMW motor with all these parts. This is an N20B20A. We're going to be inserting the crankshaft in. The first step we're going to do is putting the main bearings in to see how the crankshaft spins in there to make sure it's straight. You want to insert the main bearing so that the tang side is flush with the block and then you just give it a little bit of help from the back side. You don't really want lubrication on final assembly. This would be brake cleaned. You don't want this to be wet or have any assembly lube on it because it could cause the bearing to spin. In the middle, you'll have a guide bearing which keeps the crankshaft from moving back and forth. Same story, it has a tang on it. These bearings are already, already lubricated but you would want to put some lube on before you insert the crankshaft and see how it spins. I gave it a spin and it spun really easily which is great. Now, you don't want it to stop in the same spot each time. So if you see it stopped here, you kind of just want to have it be random where it ends up because that tells you that there's no imperfections along the way that it's even and it's not bent. Given this is brand new, we're not expecting any issues, but at the same time, we, this is an important step. It spins perfectly. This is as good as you could hope. So now that we've verified that, we're gonna start checking clearances. We're gonna be checking the main clearances by putting the bed plate on here. So on the bed plate side, these bearings are gonna be smooth. So my microphone died, unfortunately, but you had seen what I've done thus far. I put the crankshaft in the block, put the bed plate, put the bearings in the bed plate. Now we're going to check for clearances with plastic gauge. I'm going to torque these. It's going to be 20 Newton meters and it's going to be 90 degrees twice. And we'll take it off and see what our measurements end up being. And then I'll talk a little bit about a couple updates that happened to the bearings. But let's start with going to 20 Newton meters. So that was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now we're going to do 90 degrees. Here's a look at the clearances. So this is probably a point three oh zero three zero, maybe zero three two, similar zero three two, zero three zero. This one is less than. 25 it's probably a 024 which is in spec spec would be 020 to 042 or 47 i believe when i did the clearances on my x3 they were all over but then i dialed them in to be around 027 028 030 would be ideal technically so with these original bearings that i got with my kit everything checks out even when i put my guide bearing i ch chose a lower guide bearing that was looser to hope for it to be similar to these and that all worked out. These are similar. They're all looking good. They all are actually beautiful, except for this last one's a little tighter. I could send it like this, but I have original OEM bearings. So what I'll do is I'll insert a yellow lower in this position, which should loosen that slightly to make it look more like the rest. So as you can see, that's a smooth lower bearing. It's got a blue mark on it. So this is a blue upper. This is a blue lower. This is another blue lower. This is a red lower, and this is a blue upper guide, which I don't need. This would make things even more tight if it was a red, so we don't want that. Blue's kind of in the middle, but chances are it won't be where I want to be. But it's okay, because I have a yellow upper feed, so I can just compensate on the upper side. So that means crankshaft out, get rid of this. We're going to insert our yellow upper instead, and we'll keep our same lower. We'll put the bed plate back on and see how that changes our clearances. If this is way too loose, we'll try the blue. I like it. I love it. On the money. I love it. Okay, so that clearance comes in very similar to the other clearances now. Probably 0 0.2931. They're all very similar. Now we're going to add some HVL lubricant. Well, now we can just go ahead and we'll just see how it spins with the... Uh with the HVL and we'll put the main bolts in. Okay. And that will be our final check before we move to the pistons. So that feels very nice. We'll go ahead and put the bed plate back on. We'll, we'll put the bolt in just right here and then we'll spin it. Then we'll pull it out and then we'll start playing with piston. Okay, since we're gonna make this an extensive video or a long video showing you what it takes to properly build an engine, there's a couple tools that have really impressed me that Joel brought from Raleigh Motorsports that 
are just a huge time saver and you just wouldn't realize how much you need it until you have it. And introduction right here. Want to tell us a little bit about this guy? Yeah, so this is the M12 brushless. It's the 3 8 It's got um, the two set the torque settings. And what I really like is the one because it's not very strong. And so that's only about like eight foot pounds of torque. So for something like this, where there's, you know, you want to get everything started, but you don't want to over torque it, this thing is really great. And you can, you hear the sound, but there's hardly any torque to that. And we'll see when we grab it, and the first step on this is 20 newton meters. Typically for stretch bolts, the joining torque is uh, 20 newton meters. That's just to get everything started and seated. We'll, we'll definitely be under 20 newton meters right now. It didn't even deliver 20 newton meters. On setting one. On setting one. But it's very powerful. Yeah, those are beautiful clearances. Mm -hmm. Okay, next step, we will loosen these up and we know now that the crankshaft is good as you know, the way that it spins. We're happy with that. We're happy with the clearances. We'll take this off. Then we're going to check the ring gap on the top ring of these um, pistons and then uh, we'll put them together and then we're going to insert them in and we're going to see how they spin in the bore. This block was hot tanked at a machine shop. Okay, now we need, give me an old piston. Cause see, if you look at it from up top, it can look right. But if you look from the side, you'll see that- It says not, the word top on it. Yeah, it says the word top, but you wanna make sure you're squared up. And one of the best ways is take an old piston and use the rings to make sure that way you're completely even and in the right spot when you go to check the ring gap. Yeah, that's 0.43. So what did you measure, a approximate 0 0.44? 0 0.44, mil 0 0.44 millimeters, which is probably gonna be within spec. So let's, we have to check the spec sheet and then- Then we'll um, send it. And then, yeah, as long as we're within, then we'll check the next one. We'll mark this as one, we'll put it together and then we're gonna drop it in and then we're gonna spin it in the cylinder. Uh, the crankshaft's not in there right now and the squirters aren't in there. So we're gonna drop it in and then we'll see how it spins. And that's what will make sure that we will, that's the poor man's way to make sure that the cylinder hasn't gotten out of round. It hasn't egged itself in any way. If the piston spins perfectly, then we should be good. So you're using a special uh, ring tool to put the ring back on? Correct. And these, you get this, this specific one came from Amazon. Okay, so we checked the ring gaps. The range on this one, it's on the looser end of things. So if anything, it will spin a little smoother, run a little bit smoother and allow for you to run more power technically if you want to run a tune or whatnot. But in the range is 030 mm on the upper end. And pretty much that's where we were, except one bore we could, we were just slightly over. Right, Joel, like maybe a tiny bit over. Just, just a tiny bit over spec. What about Dingleberry? That would make it bigger. We're not going to Dingleberry? Okay. I'm okay with fresh rings on an existing thing because they will still bite in. You gotta run the mineral oil. Okay, so we got the orientation of the rod in terms of what side is supposed to face towards cylinder one or the front of the engine. Lubricating the wrist pin. Pretty snug fit. Mm -hmm. Healthy Same feelings? Course. Yeah. Okay. 84 is a very common size for these N series motors, right? N54, mm -hmm. N55. Mm -hmm. 84, yeah. So the rings should be set 180 degrees apart, opposite sides. So we have the top one, the gaps here, the bottom, the second one, the gaps here. The third one it says where you can see it is right there that you want to be not over the skirt and not over the wrist pin. So just somewhere here, here. So it's like the two, the five, the seven, and the 10 o'clock position are acceptable for the oil ring. Yeah. 
Okay. Start right, right. Okay. So this is the poor man's way to check it. Just make sure that you can spin it and pull it up, spin it. So that's a that's a good snug fit. There's that's very snug. Approve. Approve. Let's let's get it to the top and look at the how even. It honestly looks a hundred percent identical. Mm -hmm. All right, it's the next day. I apologize if you guys hear any wind noise. I'm going to focus on gluing the bed plate to the block. So in preparation, using some brake clean to glue the bed plate, we're using some Durco by L Ring gasket maker. I have a guide to follow in terms of how to lay it out. So it's good to let that tack up a little bit. I've cleaned up the bed plate as well. I'm gonna lay the bed plate in place, make sure it lays flush, take it off, look for dry spots, fill them in on the bed plate, and then we're gonna squish this down, let it set and watch that no sealant gets inside the engine. And if it does, we'll just break it off as it starts to harden. I'm taking the opportunity to insert the front and rear main seals because when we bolt down the bed plate, it's going to squish the silicon right up against the seal as it's supposed to do and it'll just be a lot easier to install. So I verified by pulling it off that I have perfect even coverage on all the sealant. I didn't have to add anything. I've done this on a few occasions now so I've gotten pretty good at knowing how to put it so it would work out. Now it's time for the new main bolts. We gotta use some lubrication. So these have a joining torque of five Newton meters and then 22 Newton meters when you're done after you kind of let the sealant set. Now we're inserting the oil squirters, which would have been a little easier if we just waited and put the bed plate on after. You're supposed to insert them and then put a feeler gauge to set them so they couldn't hit the piston. Rod bearing clearance time. We measured this piston already, or this rod, and it came in at 0.38, kind of where you'd want to be for a rod bearing, slightly looser, not on the tight side. I would say this motor has the flexibility of running 530 or 540 if you want to push power, etc. About the same. We're confident in the bearing clearances. We know where we're at, we're seeing consistency, so we're gonna go ahead and slap the other pistons in and get these lubed up. So this is the best uh, is the best gasket remover that is on the market. It actually has a Mercedes part number. There it is. Yeah, I'll put a link in the description. This stuff's great for even removing uh, dried up silicon, but it gets into the micro cracks. It's pretty awesome. You let it sit for 10 minutes and it does its thing in preparation for the head gasket. All right, so you're hitting the surface with some Scotch-Brite. Blue Scotch-Brite, is it very mild? Yeah, it's pretty, it's not, it's, these are the skill craft from base actually, because they're cheap, but they're non-scarring. So okay. It's, so we're basically knocking away any corrosion and leveling the surface after we put the Loctite cleaner in preparation for laying the head gasket in place.
Yeah, yeah, once we get it on and torqued, we just need to clean the inside. I'm lined up. Let me double check. You feel like I am too. We're starting the torque sequence. It's number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we're removing the eccentric shaft out of the way to be able to get the socket on. So we're doing 30 newton meters to join. We're torquing these to 22 newton meters. Now we're doing 90 degrees of angle rotation and then we'll follow up with a round of 180. Now we'll go 180. Yeah. Getting ready to time the engine again, so I'm gonna reinstall the oil pump. It's being cleaned up thoroughly. There's a couple smaller T30s here and here. Those are just 10 Newton meters joining torque. To ensure the counterbalance shaft is gonna be in a balanced position, there's a little hole. This little piece here would fall in and insert into that and you wouldn't be able to turn this anymore. This piece would thread over here. Now it's locked into place. Now we'll insert these three T30s for the chain module. 10 Newton meters there. Now we gotta lock this so we can torque the main bolt. Your joining torque here is gonna be 20 Newton meters and then 95 Newton meters. Installing the new sprocket. I'm getting ready to time the engine. There's a couple flat spots on the camshafts. There's QR codes. You can put it upside down or right side up. So be sure to look for the QR codes when you want to go for a TDC in time. Insert your tool. These get torqued to 55 Newton meters and then 55 degrees of rotation. We're going to be locking this crank hub bolt now, but we're not going to be able to go full tight until we get it in the car and use a special tool to hold it in between the transmission. So we're just going to get this snug enough that we can do a final torquing in the car, but we have timing locked and we're going to cinch this down now. We just have the, the lock pin over here and we have a pry bar wedged in the teeth that are going up against the engine stand. Okay, so you guys saw a big gist of what it takes to rebuild one of these engines. Uh, I really wanted to avoid time lapsing or anything like that when I show, you know, when we show you how to put one of these together. But now we're at the point where it's just ancillary parts. So I'm going to go ahead and put valve cover on and put injectors on, etc. Oil pan and get it all dressed up, ready to put back in the car. And we'll try to make it so you can see this thing run in the car before the video is up. But we will switch to a time lapse now just because there isn't much to explain on valve covers, etc. There's plenty of videos there.
Hey everyone, Joel from Raleigh Motorsports for today's tips. So engine installing, we're gonna do a few things to set up here. One of the things we're gonna do is we will put the hood in the service position, which is vertical. And then the other thing is how to set this engine hoist up to give you the easiest time to get the engine installed back in the car. So we have a leveler here. And then you can see what we did was we have this chain right here and this chain right here and these are connected to the i removed one engine uh, motor mount bracket the upper bracket that bolts onto the engine i put one of on each side a bolt on each side so i pulled the bolt out and that's what the chain is connected to in the back and then of course we have the tow hook slash engine support uh in the front here at the oil filter housing and we just have a hook right here so we will get this thing up and on and off the engine stand and then we'll get positioned and you'll see the other tips about the hood in the upright position and how we have the transmission because that's another important thing but we got to get the camera turned around that beautiful. beautiful we're going to put the thing into the service mode and then we're going to talk about the transmission real quick going up so now we showed you the setup for the engine this is the setup for the engine bay you can see we have a transmit we have a jack underneath the transmission we have the transmission up just about as high as it will go okay because we don't want to smush the pan so we have it about just about as high as it'll go you can see we have the hood in service mode and we have the prop rod there holding it up and then uh, the, what you'll want to do, and then also the last thing is no motor mounts in the subframe. And that's so it, to make it easier to give you the maximum amount of room to, because now we can go up a little bit still on the transmission or go down a little bit. We can go up on the engine or down on the engine once we get in there based on, you know, how it lines up. We get a couple bell housing bolts connected to the engine and then we're good to go. Then you just lift all the way up slide the motor mounts underneath the brackets the engine brackets for the motor mounts and then drop it back down and you're done and you can see we have all the stuff pinned to the side here and tucked away so we don't smash it so the goal is not to smash it so we are now ready to get the engine in place and get it hung over and get it in Okay, we're going to give the car a prime. We're going to run the starter without the fuel pump connected to build up oil pressure. We're probably going to do three cycles. We're going to start that now. Lots of compression. All right, just interrupting the video really quickly here. If you're seeing this, this car is still available. I want to just remind you guys that we have this 13X3 where the engine was fully rebuilt. Haven't even started the detail yet, just did decontamination and the paint is already looking really good this thing's going to look absolutely spotless once it gets polished compounded ceramic coated etc but this is even before anything is done believe it or not the interior has yet to be detailed so this thing is super clean mechanically perfect it's literally a 10 out of 10 it runs perfect the engine is just really smooth and sweet transmission's great we check the adaptations it's in perfect condition really genuinely a good car that i've put a couple thousand miles on and was thoroughly impressed with how brand new it felt. You don't have wear and tear on the steering wheel, the interior buttons, etc. The engine is still cold, but it's very smooth and quiet. If you didn't see it, go back to a couple of videos where we rebuilt this engine. So if one of you guys are looking for a really good daily driver, this has Oyster interior, it has surround view and parking sensors, etc. So it's decently specced. But if you guys are looking for a really nice daily driver, I'm looking for 14.9 and I'm going to be pulling this out of the video once the car sells. So if you're seeing it, it's available. So I plan to do a YouTube short showing how the paint turned out and everything, but right now it's already in really good condition. So I'll put my email address in the description if you'd like to reach out and put a deposit on this. It's pretty much ready to go. Title is in hand. 
and the mechanical work is done on it. Just finishing the details, so if you guys want it, it's ready to go. Uh, I'm in Southern California in San Diego, but we can send it anywhere really. So reach out if you're interested. By the way, we're running break-in oil in here right now. Because of the clearances on the cylinder block, we opted to not use the dingleberry thing because uh, we didn't want to make the clearances more than they need to be. We already checked by rotating the motor over a couple times that they were shiny and the uh, mating had already started, but we're using break-in oil to really get the rings to bed properly like a new engine. And by the way, when you use a dingleberry honing tool, it's just for when your cylinder bores are in good shape. In this particular case, uh, they were in good shape, but you would use the stones, the honing stones, if you thought things were not perfectly shaped. All right, as you can see, engines out of the car. We had drained the oil to see the condition of it, as you should after you do a rebuild, and we saw what we didn't want to see. The mechanic's worst nightmare, some glitter. And, you know, we had to be prepared for that. I bought this as a complete kit, uh, a crankshaft that was supposed to be OEM, but, you know, refurbished or new, but it turned out to be a knockoff. We checked everything, we measured everything, did bearing clearances and made sure everything was of good enough quality that it would run perfectly fine and we got burnt. And I'll tell you what happened. So Joel reached out to a guy named Tassos. He has a YouTube channel. I'll put a link in the description. He has really cool engine content and he's a great resource for information regarding engine builds. Uh, he ran the scenario by him. We checked everything and we were wondering why we lost rod bearings. Just at very early stages, no knock or anything. So if you were to place this right in the middle of the crankshaft, right about there, you'll see that that hole is only partially where it needs to be. It's supposed to be more toward the center. Now, if you put this inside here, it goes on a 45 degree angle and goes to get fed from the main bearing that's adjacent to it. So what happened here is they didn't drill this in the right spot, so that means it was only getting partial oil flow, which wouldn't have mattered at low RPMs, but it mattered at high RPMs. So that was our issue. This crankshaft was not made properly, so I sourced a good used OEM crank and got new OEM bearings. If you look inside here, here's all OEM main and rod bearings. For perspective, this entire kit costs more than the crankshaft, more than the connecting rods and everything. It's just because OEM bearings are very expensive, but they're safe. So I got a set of good used rods. We have a good OEM crankshaft to install. So I wanted to vet the solution. If it was going to be good quality, we checked everything. We checked the weight of it. We looked at the forging. We mic'd all the journals to make sure everything was in good condition and it was going to work, but it was just lack of experience, not knowing that this should be more toward the center, meaning it's not going to be fed adequately from the main bearings that caused us to just move away from this. Going with a used OEM crank and used rods, but new hardware, including new OEM main bolts and rod bolts and bearings is going to be a safe bet as usual. Uh, I've put 2,000 miles on the X3 that we did the rebuild on. If you look a couple of videos back on the channel, that thing is running beautifully after 2,000 miles. There's only one way to do it with these. You got to go OEM crank. And it wasn't an intention to try to get an aftermarket crank. The intention was to get an OEM crank that I had thought was refurbished to new condition, but it's the knockoff. It even says BMW on here, but of course it's not OEM. So I'm going to be busy doing the teardown again, getting the crankshaft out, doing the changing of the connecting rods and whatnot. I'm not sure how much of that I'll include in here, but I'm going to put you on time lapse for now.
Hopefully you guys won't notice a difference in quality, but I'm just moving over to my iPhone now. So we got Joel here that did call that the rod bearings uh, were being starved of oil, but in terms of the actual cause, we found that out via one of your favorite YouTubers, right? Tassos? Yeah, I, I actually had Tassos confirm it for me because Tassos Mercados is the man. So if you check him out on YouTube, that guy, if you like watching engine builds, Dazas, a lot of Mercedes, Porsches, uh, does every once in a while. He's got some S63 as he does, um, BMW S63 engines. And he's pretty much the best builder out there. And so I always like to bounce stuff off of him because he knows more than I do. And I originally called the crankshaft when I was looking at the drilling on the Chinese crankshaft. And I was like, oh, look at the countersinking. What I didn't notice is how far off center it was. And I probably should have noticed. So once we tore the engine down, I noticed immediately that the Chinese crankshaft mains were not feeding the rods. And here's what I mean by that. You see there's a hole right here for the, uh, for the main bearing. That's where the oil feeds the connecting rod. And I'll show you, you see this hole right here, it goes right through. So if you zoom out on that, you can see that this main feeds this rod bearing right there. Yeah, and every other journal is the same way except for the last one. You won't find a hole because there's no adjacent exactly. rod bearing there. The Chinese one was not centered, so it was probably feeding just enough oil pressure to handle idle and low RPMs. As soon as you go high RPMs, it spun the bearing. So this is an OEM original crankshaft now used but in very good condition. OEM rod bolts, OEM bearings, which are very expensive, and OEM rod bearings. New OEM rods that are in good shape. So we kind of just went to the point where we're doing what we know works. We did it on the X3 that's got a couple thousand miles on it, all OEM. So here's the one that we received. It says BMW on there, but it is a counterfeit. And sadly it didn't work out. I had thought I was ordering an OEM crankshaft that was just repaired at a machine shop overseas and saving some money. I didn't think it was going to be a counterfeit. So, and you can see how tight of a fit that is. Yeah, it doesn't even fit in there it well. It doesn't but... fit in there hardly. And then we have the star all. of the show, Mr. Yoda. Yoda, what's wrong with the what's wrong with the bearings, Yoda? My neighbor Alex is going to start an Instagram channel for him because he's quite Probably the entertainer. Yeah. Right? I'm encouraging it. So you guys comment yeah, if you want to see Yoda. Yeah, my wife's trying to fix up on the channel. Okay. I already have two Instagrams. Okay. Don't crawl on the Chinese crank. All right, Yoda, what do you think? Does that not pass the? Uh, does that not pass the, so that the inspection? That one's good. You know what? He, he's looking for somewhere to, to take a dump, and he's like, wait, that looks like shit. So. But even here, you can see how off-center it is. If you just look at this one, you can see how off-center that is. The center is right here, and you can see half of the thing is off. So that's covered by the bearing. Yeah, so a couple of the rod bearings were completely copper-colored, and a couple were just not in great shape. It was probably due to the fact that uh, some of the holes were more centered than others, so you could go a few miles on it. But regardless, my intention was not to use Chinese components. My intention was to get OEM stuff that was fixed overseas and as good as new, but we're not going to do that anymore. There's only one way to do it, which is an OEM crankshaft. Pretty much OEM bottom end, but these pistons are really good. Yes. Very happy with the pistons. They are, you know, they have nice new coated skirts. They're going to be utilized going forward for any of these builds, but OEM rods and OEM crankshaft. Here's a crank clearance, pretty consistent. That's too loose. That's about the same. So I'm going to tweak by putting a tighter bearing on the center section. So what I'm doing here is putting a blue bearing in place of a yellow, which splits the difference. It's a little bit tighter. As you can see, there's the first journal, second journal, third journal, fourth journal, and fifth journal. So somewhere around 0.27, which is uh, right in the middle of the range and a little bit on the tight side, but perfect for 5W30. So we achieved that by putting in a blue bearing in the guide position. If you look at that bearing, you'll see a blue stamp on it. For instance, the next one's yellow. 
if you look at the bed plate, it's actually grooved and designed to take a lower guide bearing. Here's a lower guide bearing that we checked for clearance. It took a little bit of wear when it was on that Chinese crankshaft because we did want to update to that. So anyway, uh, I would have replaced it anyway, but it was still usable, but at the end of the day, we decided not to use it. This is a yellow lower guide bearing. And this update, where this can fit right in there and help crank walk from the top and the bottom. So if you notice on the block portion, uh, there is a guide bearing, it comes from the factory. Here's the bed plate of a spare block that I bought to get that crankshaft out of it. As you can see, it came with a non-lower guide bearing from the factory. In 2015, they updated and added this to potentially help fix the issues with these N20s and make them a little bit more robust. But it was always notched that way. So now that we knew the color coding, yellow, blue, and red, we tried a blue and it was on the money, so we ordered a blue lower guide bearing. And I'll show you installing that uh, as an update to the N20. Um, to fix this and then this thing's going to be completely dialed in terms of clearances now for, for rod bearing clearance There's either red yellow, which is going to be code R on the crankshaft If you notice right there, there's a bunch of R's that tells you that they're going to be the red yellow combination If there's a bunch of B's there, it would be uh, Blue violet. So we have a we have everything we need in terms of getting this clearanced for factory rod bearings So that's the last thing we're going to show in terms of the plastic gauge clearance with OEM rod bearings, OEM crankshaft, OEM main bearings with the updated lower guide bearing. And then I'm just gonna cut over to us getting the car running again starting because we've already covered the whole procedure, except now we're doing it right with all OEM. So I'll catch back up when we're putting the lower guide bearing in and when we're doing the rod bearings. So as discussed, here's the lower guide bearing. It's smooth and it's got thrust bearings on the side for better reinforcement. So I got the right clearance now, a blue bearing. I'm gonna stick that in the lower bed plate and we can start reassembling the motor. But this is technically an update for your N20 if you wanna make it so that the crank won't move around as much. All right, that's where the bearing clearance ended up. If that's how the rest of them look, then we'll just cut over to us trying to start the engine. Maybe you'll see a time-lapse of final assembly, but otherwise that looks good, 0.38. We're gonna attempt a first start now. We had some oil leak into the turbo during disassembly, so it's cleaning up that smoke. All right, guys, here's the car. It's running, engine's perfect. We checked the oil filter. Everything looks good. Changed the oil. Engine's running perfect. We put many miles on it. Here it is after the exterior detail. New headlight lenses, new fog lights, ceramic coat and protection of the paint and full polish. Done by Joel from Raleigh Motorsports. If you guys are interested in getting this type of service done in your car, we'll put a link in the description. Do a quick look in the interior. We'll give her a start. There you go, all systems okay. Fog lights on. It is perfect. I'll show you under the hood. All right, so here's it running. It hasn't finished its cold start yet, but it runs very well. These motors are not naturally quiet, but it's super smooth for a little four. So the new owner is going to get quite the car and many miles out of this thing. There you go. It just idled down, as you can see, basically a new motor. So, you know, we had some uh, trouble through the video, as you saw, we learned some lessons. You know, we would have, in retrospect, right from the beginning, if we knew that the parts we were getting for the engine were Chinese, we, of course, wouldn't have even tried. But anyway, that's how you make one of these motors brand new.
If this is the first video you're catching on mine, please consider subscribing. If you liked it, please give it a like so I rank higher. Thanks for watching.